What's going on AFL Fantasy Free Fam? Welcome back to the channel. For those that are new around here, I'm Jacob, aka the AFL Fantasy Freak. Look guys, it's been a while since I've jumped on the old YouTubes. I just want to start off by apologising. I've had a pretty hectic schedule with work recently, so I know that's not an excuse to not be pumping out videos, so I'm back here on the YouTube scene. Today we're going to be talking about what guys I like, different trade scenarios and different trade options going into round 16 of the AFL season. So enjoy the video guys. No messing around, we're going to get straight into some names, straight into some juicy AFL fantasy content. So, we're going to be going through some guys from the trade guide that I've written. It's on my website, the link for that is in the description if you guys want to go check that out. But firstly, I'm going to be starting with Taylor Adams. Look, straight back into the side, record, season high, time on ground. High centre bounce attendances, all the good stuff that we want to see. And as a result, he pumped out a score of 116, I believe, somewhere around that. Adams has proven in the past he can score with the elite. He's posted 115 averages in the past. And if he's going to be playing this sort of time on ground in this type of role, I do think that we can see 110 plus from Adams. And I think that he's a great option this week. He does have a pretty poor injury history, so that's something to consider. But he is unique. He does have the ceiling, so he ticks a lot of boxes. And he's certainly one that I'm pretty keen on. We'll talk about him a little bit later when we get into what I'm looking to do with my moves. Next, we have Lockie Neal. I traded Neal in a couple weeks ago and... Having gone through the Duncan disaster that most of you guys are probably familiar with now, seeing him go down, holding his shoulder like this, like his season was over, was not what I wanted to see first game of the round. But look, I turned the game off at half time. I couldn't cope with any more fantasy nonsense. So I flicked it back on halfway through the last quarter to see that he'd made his way up to the mid 80s. Huge smile on my face, and then he finished strong and managed to get to 106. So, just want to give a quick round of applause for Lockie Neal. Absolute beast. Look, he looks like he's back on track, guys. Back-to-back -to -back tons now, and he's got an absolute wonderful fixture draw. The only query is that shoulder. They do have Adelaide this week, so there could be a potential for a late withdrawal or a rest there. So that's just something to consider. I'd have a backup plan. If he is named, I'd still be getting on board if you do want to chase a midfield premium option. At the end of the video, you will see he is featured in my top targets for the round. I'd just have a backup plan. There are some other great options that play after him. So make sure you've got that plan. If he is a laid out, then make sure to adjust accordingly. Next, we've got the pig himself, Tom Mitchell. Look, since the buy, he's fucking hit his straps big time. 120, 130, 130. Look, we know what the pig can do. He's pumping these types of scores at the moment. I expect these scores to continue to some sort of degree. I think he can be 120 for the rest of the year. If you don't own him, get on board now. He is highly owned. But he's one of those players that if he's producing those types of scores, you probably can't keep up with the pack that do have him. So I'd be getting on regardless of his high ownership. Uh, Zach Merritt is the next name on the list. Zach Merritt was one that was highly featured in the guide, in the targets last week. So if you jumped on board, if you were a non-owner, you got highly rewarded with a season high at 153 score. 
Look, Merritt is an absolute must-have. He needs to be someone in your trade plans in the near future if you do not own him. But that being said, this is probably not the week to get him. They do play, play Geelong this week, and we do know that Mark O'Connor has been doing run with roles. It's highly likely that he will go to Merritt after last week's performance. He could potentially go to Parrish, but I don't think that that's going to be the case. So we could see a low floor type game from Merritt this week. Hopefully not lower than 70, but we'll have to wait and see there. But if you're a non-owner, now's probably not the time to jump on board. Lockie Whitfield, absolute must-have. Probably has the highest ceiling of any defender. So he'll be one highly targeted this week if you do not own if he's one that you do not own, I'd be making him a priority this week. I'd be getting on board. He has that ceiling and you don't want to miss out when he does pump a 140 type score. Moving on to the next guy. Look, this is going to be a little spoiler alert. You probably know who it is, but he's going to be the number one on the trade targets this week. That's probably been a dead giveaway, but we're talking about Brody Grundy here. He's got the ceiling. He's relatively unique. I do think we'll see a big spike in ownership this week as lots of people will be getting on board. Look, there's not much to say here. Set and forget, top two, gives you a captain option. He ticks every box. You want to be getting on as soon as possible. Just one thing to consider with getting Grundy this week is... Just be weighing up your trade scenarios and how much point gain you're actually getting. So what I mean by this is if you've got a Riley O'Brien in your ruck and you're trading up to a Grundy, you might be getting 30 points there, right? But if you can trade a Tom Phillips to a midfield premium, you might be able to get 40 points from that trade. So Whilst Grundy is the number one target this week, it's just going to pe depend on your side, what you can do with your trades and how many extra points you can get on field. So next we've got Dangerfield. Look, he's back in form now. His time on grounds increased 10% since his first game back. I expect him to stay around that mid 80s for time on ground. He is playing quite a lot forward, but... We know what he can do coming into the business end of the season. He's just starting to get rolling now. I expect him to produce 100 plus for the rest of the season. So he's one that I'm highly keen on and is probably my number one target in that forward zone this week. Uh, Dane Zorko, another forward option. Comes at a hefty price tag though. He's 800,000 plus now. He's... Last five games, he's produced a 122 average, so he's been a super pod for those that have got on board early. He does have a very nice run of games coming up, so many expect that his scoring will continue. Me, personally, I'm not super bullish. I think he can be in that 105 to 110 range, which is still fantastic. He's right up there in terms of the best forwards available, but you are paying a premium for him, so... Personally, I'd be more inclined to go with Dangerfield, save that 160k, which potentially gets you another premium upgrade next week. And realistically, Dangerfield's capable of averaging 105 as well, so you might not actually miss out on any points if you decide to go that way. Next, we have Scott Pendlebury. Lots jumped on board last week. His ownership did spike quite a bit. But there is no denying that he is super value. Any queries of a role change with a new coach were squashed last week when we saw him attend 90% CBAs. Absolutely gold. Absolutely what we want to see. So he's almost a must-have now at the price. I'd be jumping on board for sure. Clayton Oliver's interesting. He does have a super high break-even, but he's very unique among top sides. His form recently has been not that great, despite him actually playing quite well. It's only a matter of time before we see Oliver flip the script here. I do think he can be 115 for the rest of the year. He can produce ceiling games. He's relatively consistent. 
GWS this week, so he might get tagged by De Boer, even though I think it's more likely that we see De Boer play forward and potentially go to a Christian Salem type. I don't think, especially if GWS bring Cornelio back, they're going to have so many names through there. I think they're going to try go head-to-head -head with Melbourne. I don't think they're going to waste a midfield slot throwing De Boer in there to play a pure shutdown role on Oliver. So I don't think he will get tagged, but the potential's there, the high break-evens there. So I'd probably wait one or two weeks, but he's certainly one that I'm very keen on in the near future. Jack Crisp outside of Whitfield is probably the pick of the bunch for the defenders, purely based off the fact that at the, at the moment, he's going at the same clip as Laird and Mills, but he does have that lower ownership. He is more unique. And as you guys can tell, I'm very big on unique players' ownership as these are the guys that are going to give you that edge on the rest of the competition. If a highly owned player like Laird, for example, gets injured, then if you've got a crisp, then you're going to get that advantage over everyone else. So I like crisp as an option. He's playing high midfield minutes still. Whether or not he continues in that role, if Dugowie goes into the midfield this week, we could see Chris potentially play more half-back, but regardless, he's going to score. He's got that fantasy ability in him, so I like him as an option. Cornelio could be back this week. I wouldn't be jumping on first game back, but depending on what his role looks like, I'm personally thinking we see him play a bit more forward, but if his role's good, he could be very cheap in a few weeks' time, and he could be one of those guys that you're getting your last upgrade, that last rookie off-field to potentially a Cornelio type. Elliot Yo, Bailey Smith, uh, Dion Prestia, all these guys are in that mid to high 500s price tag. Look, I probably wouldn't be jumping on any of these guys. I'd be waiting one more week and potentially seeing what Bailey Smith's role looks like. We did see him attend 74% CBAs on the weekend, which we haven't seen all season, pretty much. It was encouraging to see that the Bulldogs ran a four-person midfield rotation with Bailey Smith, McRae, Bontempelli and Liberatore all attending high centre bounce numbers. That looked like a set rotation. So in previous weeks, they've thrown... Caleb Daniel and some other names through there. It looks like they've gone back to a solid midfield rotation, but it's hard to trust Bebo. I'd be waiting one more week, but if his role looks the same next week, then he could be a solid, cheap option, despite burning some coaches earlier in the season. Elliot Yo looks like his time on grounds increased, so... Look, I don't think we're going to see it get to 80+. plus. If it stays in that mid to high 70s range, then he's certainly one that you could roll the dice on despite his poor performance on the, we on the weekend. West Coast in general were just very poor. So, And then, yeah, Dion Prestia, look, he's super injury prone, but we know he can be 95 to 100. I'd wait one more week, see how he goes this week, let him build back into things. And he could be one that you potentially roll the dice on. But I'm not super keen on any of those guys. I think at this stage, you have to be going to guys that you want to keep in your side for the rest of the season. Uh, a couple of defensive options on the cheaper side. Jordan Ridley, Nick Haynes. Look, Haynes has been very popular the last few weeks. He does have the low break even, but I don't expect him to keep this type of scoring up. If you were looking for a cheap option and you were tossing around that price range, I'd be going Jordan Ridley over Nick Haynes. Uh, a couple more defensive options. Uh, it's hard to go past Shannon Hearn's recent form. Very unique. No one has him, so he could be one that really gives you an edge. If you take out his injury-affected score, he has averaged 101.5 this year. He is the general down back for West Coast. He is taking lots of marks, all the kick-ins, and he's been very consistent. So the only thing here is the age, is the injury, and the potential rest factor. 
For those reasons, I personally probably wouldn't be doing it, but he is cheap. Compared to some of these guys that are going 100 plus, you're potentially saving 100k here. So I don't hate the move personally, but I probably wouldn't do it. And then a couple names that are popular, Jordan Degoe, Jake Stringer. What are my thoughts on these guys? I wouldn't be touching either of them, especially Degoe. I think with Adams back and a new coach, there's just too much going on there. He does have a very low break even, but I don't see him being a keeper. And the likelihood that he goes back to scoring poor scores is pretty high in my opinion. I think we will see him play more forward. I think from what we saw on the weekend, Collingwood look like they're pretty set on playing Pendles, Adams and Crisp through the middle and then potentially throwing some other names through there. Dugowie will probably get rotations, but I don't see his CBA numbers being at the heights they have been at recent weeks. So he's not an option for mine. And Jake Stringer, look, same price, same break even relatively. I do like Stringer more than Dugowie, although I still wouldn't be going with him. Dylan Shiel could be back this week or very soon, and... That's just more queries on how much midfield minutes we're going to see Stringer play. So while he's been fantastic, look, he's 526 now. It's an awkward price. I think you're better off just paying up that extra 80k and getting to a Pendles type, for example. So those are some names this week, guys. If I'm going to spiel off my top targets this week, number one, Brody Grundy. Number two, Lockie Whitfield, number three, Tom Mitchell. At number four, I have Taylor Adams. Number five, we have Patrick Dangerfield. At number six, Lockie Neal. And number seven, Scott Pendlebury. So those are the guys that I'd be looking to target this week. In terms of what you're looking to do with your trades, guys, make sure you prioritize your upgrade at this stage of the competition. Getting points on field is vital, and therefore I wouldn't be paying up for rookies. Cash generation is less important at this stage, and with the ability to loophole off the bench, you should have some guys already sitting there that are capable of 60-plus scores. So I'd be loopholing with what you've got and going down to the cheapest playing rookies to give you the most cash to get the best upgrades. So that being said, guys... What I'm looking to do this week, Jacob Kaczynski to Leo Connolly, and then I'll be finally, finally fucking off Tom Phillips. Absolute piece of shit season. So grateful that I'm finally getting rid of him, but at this stage, I'll be going to Taylor Adams. I do already have Mitchell. I do already have Lockie Neal and, and Dangerfield and some of these other guys. So for me, personally... My season's in shambles right now. I'm trying to get a bit of enjoyment out of the game, and I really have always liked Adams as a player. So despite the injury factor, I'm willing to roll the dice on him based off the fact that I just like him as a player. He's got good potential, and he's unique. So that's what I'm looking to do this week, guys. Let me know in the comments what you guys are looking to do with your sides. If you need any help, with your trades this week, make sure to leave that in the comments of this video. Please drop a like if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe to the channel for more AFL fantasy content. And until next time, guys, keep climbing up the ranks. Look, I'm about my pledge, bitch. I'm decked up on blue bills, and I won't stop until the cash pit. There's like fall leaves in the backfield. Tell her out of my face if she coming with that bullshit. Quick to save my peace, I'm so after school special. She